So before we get any deeper into this, I absolutely have to make certain that I say out the gate that I have not played Persona 4, or Persona 4 Golden, or any of the other versions of this. I do not like RPGs, their gameplay does not excite my blood, and their stories feel recycled most of the time. But I am aware that Persona 4 is some sort of golden calf for a lot of people, so keeping that well in mind, I'm going to push through this one and see where we end up. This isn't the first time I've tried to get through this one either, I will say, but I will fight through it for the sake of this video. Now, assumedly, if you're watching this video, you're familiar enough with Persona 4 to tell me that I'm a moron for not digging it or whatever, but for those of you in the cheap seats, I'll lock this down for you. You, Narukami, which is a pun on becoming god, moves to the town of Inaba and finds himself wrapped up in a mysterious murder case. After getting sucked into a TV with his friends, he faces down his inner self and gains the power of Persona. This show's persona names, at least the major ones, are named after Japanese mythology and gods. Yu's primary persona is called Isunagi, and other names show up like Jiraiya, Himeko, Takemi Kazuchi, Orochi, Susano, etc., etc. Yu lives with Detective Dojima and his daughter Nanako, who exists to be adorable, and not much else. They only factor in so much to the main story at this point. The meat of the story revolves around Yu meeting friends, meaning Yosuke, Chie, and Yukiko. Kanji and Rise come in later, and Naoto much later, but once the core four get together, then they get down to getting personas for themselves, and move on along to try and get to the bottom of the supernatural mystery. Which I really won't talk about until it's important. When you have a long-form murder mystery like this, the journey is much more important than the finish. And I should think that most people were more interested in the characters than anything else. So with this in mind, I ask my first big question. Aren't you supposed to like main characters? Now, this may just be a problem with adaptation and the lack of interactivity, but I do not like you. Fitting for someone who's being adapted from a silent protagonist, he's extremely passive in the story to the point of being unlikable, but everybody just kind of rolls with it. That's the ultimate version of my biggest pet peeve with this sort of thing. The character doesn't matter in their own story because everyone progresses like they're not there. Sure, he's the catalyst for the show getting rolling and bringing everybody together, but he doesn't do a whole lot to keep everyone there. Again, missing interactivity is probably a huge facet in this feeling so aggressively mad to me. That's sort of going to be the crux of this review, because I'm not playing as you, I'm watching you, I don't have the same level of investment as the people who played the game. So by this I mean specifically that you is presented as a character here instead of the player's avatar, meaning that their path of least resistance is a compromise that feels kind of like lazy writing. But it's the only way to maintain this knife edge balance between storytelling and authenticity to the game. There's just no winning here. So we may as well not knock it too hard. However, once we hit Kanji's characterizations, then we definitely will find things to knock. So, before we get any further, I'm going to say some stuff that's definitely going to be controversial to some of you, even though I feel this is probably a finished issue. You might want to hang loose on your SJW comments or whatever, because I know already. Trust me, I know. And I would like to posit that Japanese culture, being a profoundly traditional society as opposed to a modern one, is about 10 years behind the states in its portrayal of LGBTQ folk. This is a rough estimate, mind you, but keep this in mind when we're talking about this sort of issue. So, Kanji Tatsumi, huh? Big, scary-looking 15-year-old pushing 40? Kanji, for lack of a better term, is gay. This is known, Khaleesi. This is not up for debate, at least in the anime. Now, Atlas can say whatever the fuck they want about this situation, but that does not change the fact that Persona 4's depiction of Kanji Tatsumi's shadow self is a flamboyant caricature of a gay man. Kanji is not happy about this, and they make great strides to avoid saying that he is, in fact, a homosexual. Again, keep in mind what I said about LGBTQ topics in Japan. I think anybody could see that he is in fact attracted to men, and it is not a secret considering his reaction to Naoto's interest in him soon after. Atlas can say whatever they like, but their presentation of the material says the other. This is part of a bit of literary criticism called the death of the author. If the material presents something, and you read something into it, but the author definitively says it wasn't supposed to be in there, well, that doesn't change the fact that it's there. This is the basis of literary critique, and while it maybe feels a little peculiar when it comes down to authors who are still in living memory, it doesn't change the existence of what you saw in it. Now, I gotta know, was this open homophobia considered charming when this came out, 
Or is it just another example of Yusuke being a shithead? At any rate, the fact that he says, I hate that this guy's inside me is a pretty damning statement about his sexuality. Kanji Tatsumi is a gay man. And no amount of Atlas trying to override it will change that. Anyway, you're probably guessing right now what I'm going to say about a certain other character in short order, but let's roll onwards. By about 10 episodes in, I'm praying for a total party wipe. Tonally, this is not doing the job. This is too much comedy and not enough explanation. The combat feels detached from anything because it's relying on you knowing the game to remember why these enemies matter, or at least were memorable. The battles rely on self-actualization for the main thrust of their efficacy, or at least admitting that you're kind of shitty, but leading up to that, there's a whole lot of deus ex machina and you getting new personas just sort of because. Especially when Teddy goes berserk, it all kind of feels like mini-moosing the situation. What is that? No, uh, that's Mini Moose, my uh, other sidekick. Uh, yep, yep, been with me the whole time. Regardless of any of that, I think what I'm realizing is that the main thrust of this series is learning who you are, and it hit a lot of people my age at just the right time that it affected them. I've known pretty much who I've had to become early on, and I know what my shadow self looks like. That might be part of the reason I'm ricocheting so hard off of this show, but eh, who's to say? Twelve episodes in, still not really grasping if this show is representative of the game. I feel like this show needs to be about twice as long to really get the breadth of a 40-hour game in, and yet I feel like the show is really focusing on the wrong stuff. It needs to be longer in the places it's short, and shorter in the places it's long. Why the fuck is Nanako getting two episodes while you does social links? Aren't there good stories there to be told? Again, can't stress this enough, I have not played the game, so all the in-jokes and nods to it are completely lost on me. I am led to believe that this sort of thing was necessary in the game and that's all good. But it should be taken as written that the anime version is going to get the quote-unquote good end, or at least an acceptable one. Maybe not the best ending, of course, but, like, not the downer ending. So now the second season starts off, it's all filler all the time. Isn't there still a mystery floating around to deal with? Well, not so much of one that we can't just sit through a school trip, I guess. There's a little character stuff here, but it's just tiresome. It's comical with the King's Game episode, but all I have to say is... Teen drinking is very, very, very bad. Yo, I got a fake ID, though. Yeah. I guess some shows just aren't meant to be marathoned. Anyway, you remember how I said I'd get to Naoto in a bit? Yeah, he's a good kid and deserves better than what Persona 4's story seems to want to force on him. It's a real shame that he has to go through all this nonsense. And yes, I am going to call Naoto a man, because it's quite clear that he prefers that, given his style of dress and overall manner, and to make a point once again regarding the death of the author idea. This is discounting two things, mind you. First, that Naoto could in fact just be non-binary, and Japanese doesn't really have pronouns in the same way that English does. But it's very clear that Naoto does not have any wish to be viewed as a woman, even though Atlas says it's purely for job purposes. Reinventing your entire of war like this is going a bridge too far if you just want to be taken seriously as a cop. Naoto wants to be taken seriously as a man and his shadow self says as much with the threat to put him under the knife and make his outsides match his insides. To which I should think, don't threaten me with a good time is an appropriate response. But I'm reasonably certain that gender affirming surgery doesn't include a fucking buzzsaw. Anyway, Kanji uses learning Naoto's biological gender as an excuse to power up because then he won't feel quite so gay. Bad news, buddy, you're still into a dude, even if he's got a few extra parts. Once they get Naoto on side, then they're right back into the filler stuff that really doesn't seem to have any bearing on the plot as a whole. Again, this is the sort of thing that probably felt better paced in the game, but here it just chugs. The show feels so backwards, it's doing all the character development at the back half of the show, and that's the sort of thing we ideally want to move towards the front. They're putting in what feels like filler when this could have been a good time to have the show ramping up into a fever pitch. Now, one could argue that the character development doesn't happen on a timeline and all that, but realism is not something we should be worrying about in this case, because it's a game where people walk through TVs and fight monsters. Again, hamstrung by slavish devotion to the game. But if the show follows the game too closely, then it brings all the problems of the game's narrative with it. But if it changes too much, or in some cases anything at all, then people will start losing their shit saying, it's well, not my version, or whatever. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Honestly, that's the biggest problem with the way Persona 4 the animation shakes out. When presented with a chance to do something, 
interesting or different from the material, the brass in charge says, this is how the game goes. And then soap socked them until they passed out. Truly a cruel world we live in. So given that this is ostensibly a mystery show, I won't tell you who the killer is and what their motivations are, but for all that buildup, it feels really flat. Considering who ends up in the line of fire, it feels like this? This is what we've been waiting for this whole time? Though I suppose it's fitting overall that this mess comes from someone who turns out to be astonishingly petty. As it went on, I was wondering to myself, could this have really been shorter instead? This might have been able to be 13 episodes or a couple of movies and had the same impact. The ending, though, knowing that there was a definitive finish to this story, really does end up making the show feel better overall. The payoff was a little wonky, and they kind of played fast and loose with what they were getting at early on, but getting to the finish just felt right, or maybe it's relief at seeing the end credits, what the hell do I know? Production-wise, this is a little screwy, since the version I was watching had five episodes listed as Director's Cut, was dub only, and had no subtitles to go along with it. But the dub is the same cast from the game, and I'm certain that matters to people who played the game, but everyone seemed to do a good job, and no one stuck out as a poor player. When you make an anime adaptation of a video game, you have to ask, who is this for? Is this for players of the game who will appreciate the whole thing, or is it for people who haven't played it and are interested in the series? Music's pretty good, though. Second opening theme is rad. As far as video game adaptations go, this isn't offensive, but it feels undercooked and underserved. The strange pacing, weak visuals, and a peculiar overall presentation aren't doing this any favors, and if this is just the game without the grinding, then I don't really think I have a great handle on why people enjoyed the game. It's not bad, but certainly not the life-changing experience I've been led to believe. I guess what it breaks down to is that if you don't really have time to play a 40-hour game, you're probably not in a state to really enjoy a 26-episode series either. The depth of content and interactivity is lost to this version of it, and I really can't recommend it. When people say accept no substitutes, this is the kind of thing they mean. That being said, this is Professor Otaku, the greatest American anime critic, signing off. (laughs) 